uh, I'll be introducing um, you to this uh, this topic, optical current tomography. So OCT or optical current tomography represents a non-invasive method for cross-sectional imaging of the retinal structure. So and it is based on the principle of low current um, interferometry. So basically, what happens is from from the light source, the light uh, from these machines is split into two beams. One beam goes to the eye and the other beam goes to a scanning or reference mirror. And the reflected light from the reference mirror and from the eye is kind of integrated. And the interference between these two uh, waves that is, that is obtained is interpreted. And that's how we understand the reflectivity of the tissue that we are studying. So this is basically the principle of um, inter inter interference. So uh, this is how we, uh, we, we perform the OCT. It's a, basically a non-invasive test. It's uh, within minutes, you get a wonderful cross-section of, of the retina, as you can see here, which is very close to what you see in histology. So that's a, that's a, that's a great thing about this non-invasive test. Now, because it uses light, so whenever there are media opacities, the, uh, the media opacities are going to obstruct the light entry, and therefore, you cannot see the underlying tissues. So here, as you can see in the top slide, you see there is some kind of a lesion sitting on top of the retina, which is not allowing the light to pass through. So you don't see anything underneath it. In this lesion here, you see there is a choroidal lesion, which is not allowing the light to pass through. So basically, you should not have media opacities. Or when you have um, opacities, it, it means something, or it uh, rules out certain lesions. Like in this example here, you see the, the retinal layers are absent here. The outer retinal layers are absent. And because of which light passes in easily, and therefore the choroid gets highlighted. So this, you have to keep these principles in mind before you start looking at OCT images. In this image, you see there are different types of hemorrhages. You have preretinal hemorrhages, you have intraretinal hemorrhages, and subretinal hemorrhages, and all these are causing changes in reflectivity, and therefore the underlying um, tissue is visualized in in different forms. So basically, we, you need to understand that there are three kind three kinds of machines. You have the time domain machines, the spectral domain machine, and steps OCT machines. The time domain machines are the, are the early generation machines. The, the resolution of these machines are poor. The study of vitreo retinal interface is very poor in these machines. Study of the outer retina or the photoreceptors also is poor in this machine. So that has to be kept in mind. The spectral domain machines have good resolution, and that is what we commonly use. We also have the Stepsos um, OCT machine, which has the highest resolution. And this is the machine that, um, that one needs to use if you have to study choroidal uh, pathology in detail. We also uh, use different scanning protocols. When you look at the printout, you would see these scanning protocols that, that, are, that are employed. Different machines use different scanning protocols. There's something called a line scan protocol. There is something called a radial scan protocol. And these are, this is called raster, where there is a series of lines which are used to study the pathology. Now, this is the international nomenclature. So when, when you see the OCT, these are the different layers that you see. It's very similar to what you see on histology. You see the nerve fiber layer. You see the ganglion cell layer next. And then you have the inner plexiform layer, then the inner nuclear layer, then the outer plexiform layer, and then the outer nuclear layer. As you can see, the outer nuclear layer and the inner nuclear layers are less reflective the plexiform layers are more reflective. And then you have the outer retina, which consists of the external limiting membrane. And then the next reflective layer used to be called the ISOS layer, and now it is called the ellipsoid uh, zone. And then underneath that, you have the interdigitation zone. And below that, you have the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks complex. The next thing that you need to know is that you know, we define lesions on the OCT as either hyperreflective or hyporeflective. Now, this is an example. See, this is more white in color. This is called hyperreflective. So these are all examples of hyperreflective lesions. When, when you see something which is more white on the OCT image, then it is hyperreflective. When it appears darker, then you call it hyporeflective. For example, the outer nuclear layer is hyporeflective. The inside of a PED, a serous PED, is hyporeflective. Then, when you study the choroid, we talk about block transmission. So, when you have something which is obstructing the light on the top, you don't see structures underneath it. This is called block transmission. And whenever when there is no layers on top, but allows light to pass easily, when the choroid gets uh, very prominently um, seen, then you call it as hypertransmission. 
So these are the terms that we generally use when you describe OCG. So this is the checklist that I, you know, I usually tell my fellows. This is the checklist that one needs to have. Whenever you get an OCT, just identify what is the type of scan that this machine is, in, uh, is, is involved. Is it a time domain scan? Is it a spectral domain um, OCT or is it a source OCT? How is the scan, uh, scan quality? Is it just a retinal scan or is it a choroidal focused uh, scan? Now, there are certain scans which focus on the choroid. These are called enhanced depth imaging scans. And then you look at the contour of the of the scan. I mean, the, the, the image that you get is, is there a generalized change in the contour or is there any focal um, areas where the contour has changed, like a foveal contour? Uh, is it affected? And then you have to start looking at a particular order. You start from the vitreous, you look at the surface of the retina, you look at the superficial retinal layers, then you look at the outer retinal layers and then the choroidal layers. So and each of these layers, you need to look for alterations in reflectivity. You comment on whether this, uh, the, the lesion that you see is hyper-reflective or hypo-reflective. And then finally, you decide whether you, this scan is enough or do you need more scans to study a particular disease. Some diseases you require multiple scans to, to study that disease in its entirety. And then you also can make measurements. So this is the checklist that, uh, that one needs to uh, have before you start um, looking at OCT images. Now, let us see a few examples. Now, this is, these are images of time domain OCT. So this is the, the first generation OCT uh, uh, images, which as you can see has very, has very poor resolution. You don't see the individual layers very clearly. In contrast, if you look at these images, these are spectral domain OCT images where you can see all the individual layers very clearly. You can see the, the outer layers, especially the photoreceptor layer and the retinal pigment epithelium and all that is very clearly seen. Um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the spectral domain OCT. Now, this is an example of a sepsos OCT where in addition you see the choroid very clearly. So, so looking at the scan, you can identify what is the, you need to identify first, what is the type of scan that you are dealing with. The second thing is looking at the contour. Now look at this, this is, the norm, this is how a normal retinal image would look like. But look at this, here the contour, the generalized contour of the image itself is, is altered. So then you understand that this is a patient with myopia. In, myo in myopic eyes, the contour may be altered. Then you look at you know, any focal change in uh, contour. Here you see the, the, the contour is changed in the macular region alone, in all these entities. It may be just presence of fluid, or it may be some lesion of the retinal pigment epithelium, which is um, altering the contour, or it could even be a choroidal lesion, which is altering the contour. So that also, uh, uh, you can look at it uh, at one glance. So then you start going layer by layer. You look at the vitreous. You see, here you see a thin uh, membrane reflectivity. Uh, this is called the vitreomacular adhesion. In vitreomacular adhesion, the foveal contour is not altered. So that's the most important thing. In contrast, when you see membranes like this, which has altered the contour of the fovea, then we call it as vitreomacular traction. So these are the two terms, vitreomacular adhesion, vitreomacular traction. And based on the size, they are, they are further classified into focal and broad. You look at the surface of the retina. Uh, in the absence of such uh, vitreoretinal interface changes, the other vitreoretinal interface changes could be epiretinal membrane. See the surface of the retina, this is how it should be. Here there is a break in the surface. Here there is a thickening on the surface, this epiretinal membrane. Here if you see carefully, there are some small folds that you see on the surface. There is nothing but um, internal limiting membrane folds, which may be secondary to epiretinal membrane. You, you, then you look for partial defects like these. These are examples of partial defects, partial retinal uh, uh, thickness defects. This is, uh, here you can see the associated pathology here. There's a vitreomacular traction causing the partial lamellar hole. And this is um, um, a epiretinal membrane with a pseudo hole. Sometimes now you can also see defects within the retinal substance without any traction uh, outside. So these are called as lamellar defects. These are typically seen in patients like macular telangiectasia, where you can see the small defects in the inner layers or in the outer layers. This is a condition called micro hole, where there is a focal area of loss at the, at the photoreceptor layer. So this, this, these are also lamellar defects. And finally, you have full thickness defects. Um, uh, where you can also see the associated pathology. Here you can see there is a vitreomacular traction causing the full thickness defect. Here there is a full thickness defect with an epiretinal membrane. And this situation you can also see subretinal fluid um, in, along the macular hole. So all this can be made out on the, on the OCT.
The next thing is you look at the, the, the middle layers or the inner layers of the retina and look at the, and the reflectivity within these layers. Normally, you see these lines of reflectivity. As I said before, you have hypo and hyper reflective lines that are, that are seen. But when the inner retina is totally replaced by, uh, by increased reflectivity like this, then you know that you are probably dealing with a vascular entity and the inner retinal vascular entity. It could be arterial occlusion or it could even be a venous occlusion here, which in which case often you have a lot of fluid underneath that. Also, sometimes you can get focal areas of um, reflectivity here like this. So this also is a vascular pathology, which is now called as PAM, paracentral middle layer maculopathy, which is again a vascular event. So then you look at hyporeflective uh, areas. So these are examples of hyporeflective areas. You see this, these are generally called cysts. Cystic, so they, they contain fluid. Some of the cysts may have some content. These are called turbid cysts. And the cysts may be present, they're usually present in the plexiform layers. But sometimes you may see it in different layers, in, in both the plexiform layers, as you can see in, in multiple layers, as you can see in this picture here. Um, and when you see fluid under the retina, that is in the sub-retinal area, with, between the retinal pigment epithelium and the, neuro, and the neurosensory retina, then this is called as sub-retinal fluid or submacular detachment. So this is commonly seen in, the, in vascular pathologies and can also be seen in post-surgical situations. Now, one common example is um, central serous um, retinopathy. So here, these are examples of patients with central serous retinopathy where you have this sub-retinal fluid but along with that, you, you see certain signs, like you see this is elongation of the photoreceptors that we may see. You may see fibrin deposits within the subretinal fluid. Uh, this is a vacuole sign that is described along with the fibrin deposits. You see this vacuole-like appearance. So these are uh, signs that help you to make a diagnosis of central serous uh, chorioretinopathy. Sometimes in the, inside the subretinal fluid, you may see septa-like things. Now, when you see such things, then you know that it's an inflammatory pathology, like BKH. So this is a patient VKH having this finding. And sometimes the subretinal fluid may have blood inside it. So then uh, you have to think of entities like um, coronal neovascularization. Sometimes you see these cysts, which are extensive like this. Now these are patients with uh, juvenile X-linked retinoschisis. So skytic retinas also can appear uh, like this. So this is a differential diagnosis for cysts. Um, many of these conditions are bilateral. These are examples of macular schisis in myopic eyes. You can see these skytic cavities. Often you see the septa uh, that, are, that are very evident in, in these eyes. Uh, next, we look at hyperreflective uh, areas. Now, sometimes some of these hyperreflective dots may be very small like this. Some of them may be very large or thick like this. Now, these small things are called hyperreflective spots or dots, uh, whereas the large ones represent uh, the hard exudates or, in, or what we call as intraretinal hard exudates. But these hyperreflective spots are also seen not only in, um, in vascular pathologies, it can also be seen in, in age-related macular uh, degeneration, as you can see in these um, OCTs here. So when you look at the outer retina, always when you talk about outer retina, we put all these layers together. We look at the external limiting membrane. We look at the ISOS layer, which is now called as the ellipsoid layer. We look at the interdigitation zone, and then we look at the RP and Brooks complex. So all of these together, we, we call this as outer retina. Uh, now, there are certain uh, diseases where, you, where the outer retina seems to be affected. Now, these are examples of drusens, now, where you see the pathology is lying under the retinal pigment epithelium. The retinal pigment epithelium is pushed, and therefore, the overlying layers are also uh, pushed. And, uh, and this, is a, this is a confluent drusens. So, these are drusens are usually like this, but when they, when they uh, get together, they become confluent drusens. Now, these are examples of retinal pseudodrusens, where this enlarged picture clearly shows that the deposits are lying between the, the retinal pigment epithelium and the ellipsoid zone. So, this is retinal pseudodrusens, or even called as subretinal drusenoid deposits. Um, sometimes you have these elevations of the retinal pigment epithelium with fluid collection. So, these are uh, serous uh, pigment epithelial detachment. They are commonly seen in CSR, but it can also be seen in age related macular degeneration. Sometimes this, uh, this area has some content, as you can see here. There is some internal reflectivity within the PEDs. Then this is uh, called as um, fibrovascular PEDs, or what we normally call as type 1 coronal neovascularization. Some of these PEDs may have zero sanguinous uh, uh, content. So there means some portion having some reflectivity, some portion not having reflectivity. And sometimes it may contain blood, as you can see here, which does not allow light to pass through. So this is a hemorrhagic uh, uh, pigment epithelial detachment.
Sometimes these uh, pigment epithelial detachments can have reflectivity within it. So when you see layers like this, they are called multi-layered pigment epithelial detachments. And when you see this, this kind of laminated bodies, they are called uh, multi-laminated pigment epithelial detachment. Now, um, OCT is very helpful in differentiating coroidal neovascularization. Now, this is an example of a classic CNVM. In classic CNVM, the lesion is above the retinal pigment epithelium. So, this is the retinal pigment epithelium, which is fairly looking normal, except for a small breach here. But the lesion is lying above the retinal pigment epithelium. This is also called as type 2 um, coronal neovascularization. So, in contrast, in type 1 uh, coronal neovascularization, the lesion is lying under the retinal pigment epithelium. This is the retinal pigment epithelium. You see the reflectivity is lying under the retinal pigment epithelium. So this is also called as occult new, coronal neovascularization or type 1 coronal neovascularization. Now this is another example of a patient where you see the retinal pigment epithelium is throughout elevated. All the content is lying under the retinal pigment epithelium. So this is a, a diffuse type 1 um, CNVM. Whereas in this patient, you see there is a retinal pigment epithelium and you have the contents under. But at this point, there is a migration of this um, hyperreflectivity going on top of the retinal pigment epithelium. So this is a mixed CNVM where there is a type 1 CNVM and also a type 2 CNVM or both classic and occult CNVM. So OCT helps us to understand the, the exact location of the coronal neovascularization. So this is a typical OCT of a patient with a RAP, retinal angiometrous proliferation. So because this is primarily a retinal disease, you see this reflectivity in the retina and then you also see an element of pigment epithelial detachment. So this is a typical um, OCT finding of a patient with retinal angiometrous proliferance. This is a scarred CNVM. So in the CNVM scars, you see there is just a, an area of reflectivity there. So based on the presence of fluid, we, uh, we classify CNVMs into active and inactive. Now this is a CNVM which has a lot of fluid. It has subretinal fluid, has interretinal fluid. We call this an active CNVM. So in this patient uh, here, there is no fluid. We would call it as an inactive CNVM. Similarly, for uh, macular edema, again, when the, we're looking at, at the location of the fluid, we classify patients as having centrally involved macular edema. Here, where the fluid is exactly at the fovea, then we would call it as centrally involving macular edema. When the fluid is not involving the fovea, we do not call it centrally involving macular edema. Because this is the patient who, 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 who requires anti of therapy. Now, sometimes the, the outer retina, especially the, the photoreceptor or the ellipsoid zone, may be absent in as patchy like this. You see the layer is absent here, patchy. Or it, there may be a diffuse loss of layer with just preservation of the central area. So this is a typical finding that you see in hereditary dystrophies, like in, in retinitis pigmentosa, and also some of the drug toxicities, like in chloroquine toxicities. So you, where you may see the cent preserved central island of photoreceptors beyond that, you don't see the ellipsoid zone. This is an example of a patient with IJT who had a diffuse uh, or patchy areas of um, ellipsoid zone loss. Uh, so this is a patient geographic atrophy where now you, you see the retinal pigment epithelium is totally affected there, is lost there, and therefore light easily passes through and therefore the choroid is visualized. So this is an example of geographic atrophy. Uh, OCT is also helpful to study the choroid. If you see, so this is what I said as enhanced depth imaging. So not, with a normal OCT, sometimes the choroid is not very clear. So you need to use this mode, which is called the enhanced depth imaging mode, which is available in most of the machines. This helps us to study the choroid in detail. Um, but however, as I said before, the Strepsos OCT is the best um, OCT to study the choroid. So here you can see the larger vessels. These vessels are the halos vessels. The smaller vessels are the satellites. And these small dots that you see, they represent the chorea capillaries. Um, now, this is very useful because when you see a patient with CNVM, if you look at the, uh, the thickness of the choroid, it helps us to identify what is the type of CNVM. Now, these, is, these, are, these are examples of CNVMs where you can see the retinal pigment epithelium primarily affected. But you see the choroid is thicker. So if you have a thicker choroid with a CNVM, then this is most likely to be polypoidal coronal vasculopathy, PCV. Whereas this is again another patient with CNVM, but here the choroid is not thickened. So this is how a typical AMD looks like. So typical AMD is a choroid is um, not so thick. In PCVs, the choroid is thicker. And this is a myopic CNVM where the choroid is extremely thin. So if you have a CNVM with an extremely thin uh, choroid, then you probably, it helps you to make a diagnosis of myopic CNVM. Now in this um, patient here, you see the whole choroid, the, the architecture is lost. You don't see any layers. Um, you don't see the halus, uh, satellus, uh, chorea capillaries, the whole architecture. Also, the, you see a lot of folds. 
Now, this is seen in UAT conditions. Now, this is a patient with BKH who, ha who has this, uh, this pattern. And um, now, this is, a, this is another lesion where you see there's a solid lesion because it's blocking the light going through. Uh, uh, and, um, and you can see it's almost got a very smooth contour. So, this is a, an, an example of a patient with the coronal melanoma. In coronal hemangioma, I mean, if you take an OCT, what happens is you see that the, you see a lot of blood vessels still preserved amongst um, uh, the, the, the tumor. So that helps us to differentiate between coronal um, melanomas from, from hemangiomas. This is um, a patient with... Uh, Excuse, uh, Dr. Manoj. Uh, yeah. time, time, I think you just have to... Finishing, uh, just, to, to, to just, just a minute. Um, so this, these are examples of patients with lymphoma where you see irregularity of, um, of the coronal contour. Um, and this is... Uh, where, where, Sometimes no, you may confuse with the coronal mass, but sometimes the contour is, is abnormal because of certain inherent defects. Like this is a dome-shaped maculopathy that you see in myopia. Uh, so I think uh, finally, uh, I will also uh, mention about the, uh, uh, about the, it's possible to even measure the thickness in, in patients. Uh, on the OCT, you can measure the thickness. There, there are normograms that are available that also helps us uh, in follow-up of these, these patients. You can use a caliper or they have inherent modes by which the thickness is, is evident. And finally, uh, nowadays we have OCT angiography, which helps us to study uh, the retinal layers. There are different layers of uh, blood vessels that we have identified, the superficial capillary plexus, the intermediate capillary plexus, and the deep capillary plexus. And this is very helpful in, st in studying disease like diabetic retinopathy, where the foveal avascular zone is very obviously affected and in identifying CNVMs. So to conclude, um, um, OCT is very much part of uh, retinal imaging. And with all this multimodal imaging that has come in now, it is, it, it is very useful to identify a lot of macular as well as retinal pathologies, helps us to differentiate a lot of coronal pathologies and, and helps in, uh, uh, in making a very clear diagnosis. Thank you.